<laughs> All right, let's see here. All right, I thought we might take a look at Bonaparte in Italy. And I went to have a look for some of the source uh, material I have and had this book on maps and all I could find was uh, two, um, two battles, uh, the Battle of Arcola and Rivoli, which uh, are in and around the right time frame. And... Uh, you know, not a whole lot of good detail. This book actually kind of sucks. I think I picked it up at a, you know, one of those drive-by sale things. It's kind of pretty average. But anyway, so there's this that we can have a look at at some point. It's nice to get a little visual context from back in the day. So we'll check we'll check that out. And then obviously I've got Chandler's uh, monster tome here, which has a chapter on the this particular campaign in Italy. Uh, in Search of Reputation is what it's called. And I'm looking forward to giving this a bit of a read through. It, uh, it's it got the, the Pope in it, the Po uh, Riveria, Riverina area. And we can check out the Po Valley and all that sort of good stuff and get a feel for things. Oh, hey, we got a couple of folks I see. Hey there. Well, uh, Carnifex, it must be morning time there for you now. So uh, we'll have a look at that as well as a re uh, reference source, and there's some other references in the box. So uh, we'll be able to pull out some bits and pieces, and I'll probably buy a couple of things online, a couple of Kindle books, and do a little bit of reading before we get started. But So what I'm planning on doing with you right now is having a look at the map in as much detail as I can from a, you know, a noob jumping into it type of thing. I thought uh, maybe an overview of the rules that I've read. I, I took a, wrote up a two-page summary of the rules and uh, we'll have a look at the counters and the leader manifests and things like that. So maybe the first thing to do is to kind of set the context for this system and the, the, uh, the, the campaign. So <clears throat> that might require a little bit of a history lesson which may be better left to another time but because I, I'm fresh into this right I've read a, a little bit of uh, an overview and that's about it I see we've got a couple of folks joined in there hey Jordan welcome man 6 36 a.m what are you doing up watching videos you should be I don't know at work or in bed or something um the standard rules for this system are built off of the Napoleon at Bay game. This is the second edition, and as you can tell by the print quality and all the rest of it, it's still an older game. Uh, the first edition was written back in the 70s, so this makes this a 1999, 1998 edition of the game. So it's got a good, you know, engine up on 20 years, right? So a significantly aged system, it's in the same scale and vein as a habit of victory. And uh, we could probably translate or use much of the rules from uh, a habit of victory, if I had read them in detail enough, we could use them here. But I think just to do this justice and, and where this game is at and given that there's no updates online anywhere that I could find that say it's okay to use those rules, we're going to use these rules. Now the good news is that like most Kevin Zucker games, he basically takes the same basic system for uh, the core things that matter, command, movement and combat, then morale and supply, so the five sort of tenets of Napoleonic uh, combat and uh, uses basically the same system for all of them tweaking them based on the scale uh, most of Kevin Zucker's games are you know he's a very big in the Napoleonic library system which is I don't know 15 or 20 or more uh, battle scale 
games that are one to three or four maps and 500 meters a hex, I want to say, and maybe an hour or so a turn. I kind of look at that as being very tactical. Uh, obviously not as tactical as Lava Tai, but tactical enough. But what it does do is give you an opportunity to play the one or two days before the battle and establish your position much more so than setting up for just a discrete battle and everything's already decided about location and all the rest of it. So it's quasi-operational, but really it's more tactical in nature than anything else. You're, you're concerned with tactical things. You're not concerned with much about supply. and in fact, morale doesn't really play that much into the game either. And in the next couple of levels up, morale and supply really don't play too much into, it, into that either that while there are morale rules and supply rules for his other systems which i love the days system 1809 1806 they're great games supply there is really as long as you can tra trace back you know x movement points to a board edge you're in supply and if you're out of supply it it, it makes you uh, uh, and rolling for initiative a little bit more difficult so you know neither here nor there uh, morale uh, by the same token with the uh, other Zucker, the day systems, morale is not really going to lose the game for you. Now, the, accu the, the accumulated losses will force you to lose, but being uh, failing your morale really is not going to give you a, a significantly negative impact. So, with that in mind, I come to this system. This is kind of uh, scaled up another level. I think the hex size is here. Let's see, it's a couple of kilometers or something like that. Uh, yeah, uh, 3.2 kilometers per hex, and each strength point is a thousand men or you know 16 guns or whatever the case might be. And a game turn is two days, whereas the the uh, days system is half day action. So there's an AM turn. Uh, it's not half day. Maybe it's uh, it's it might be uh, maybe it's an AM and a PM turn and then a night turn. I think is how that works. So this is two days at a time, and it fact it does factor in supply to into a greater level of detail. Particularly in the exclusive rules, you're going to need to forage for things. You're going to have to uh, denote where your primary source uh, of supply is and administrative capability is. Your 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 operations center, if that's the right word to use. And uh, you will have attrition uh, enforced upon you for all your movement, and that will be reflected in the loss of strength points. So a fairly, <coughs> a feel, uh, a more detail here than in other games, and I, I quite like that. I'm going to zoom out a little bit here so we can see a little bit more about what's Oops, about what's going on. Put the legs up a bit. Uh, so the rules, I think, I, I would say, basically, as I said, same as most of the other systems. You've got other movement concepts here. Now uh, there's administrative marching and there's some forced marching, and which is kind of like a reaction move. But basically, each leader has a number of uh, points that he can initiate a turn, and he's going to uh, make a roll against his, uh, you know, management rating for want of a better term and that is going to determine whether or not the units that are in his stack or under his control will move or not uh, or how much they will move and that's the same for the day system it's very similar to other systems as well to the lower and tactical stuff except down at the lower level individual units can roll against their own initiative rating and uh, and kind of go for you know, be, be independent so to speak uh, movement is all pretty much the same. The, you know, leaders have an effect upon combat to a marginal degree if they have a star in their little counter. Uh, the uh, sequence of play is identical. It's in combat, and then you do some morale stuff. Uh, wrap up, wrap up phase. You know, uh, you, there is going to be a replacements concept in. In, that is detailed in this here, which is going to see a number of points of replacement steps come back to you every fortnight or two weeks, nine, ten days, uh, several several turns since two, ter two a turn is two days. 
Uh, movement works the same. There are vedettes that work the same as all the other games where you can, you know, push up against a unit and see what it is, right? Uh, you can repulse units that are on the road. If you have greater than seven to one, that'll bounce that unit out of the way and they'll have to retreat and you can keep moving down the road, kind of like a Napoleonic overrun, You, I guess you could say. And then you have the combat system. And that's one of the main differences, I would say, with uh, this this particular game versus others, versus other games in the system. The combat uh, rules have m m several steps to them. Let's skip down to them, actually, because it's worth having a look at. Zones of control work the same as well. Uh, the same old, if you're in an enemy zone of control, you have to fight, that sort of thing. Different stacking limits, obviously, because it's different scale. So what happens here, typically, is you are electing what type of battle you're going to conduct. So you might conduct uh, either a pursuit battle or a pitched battle. And, and both sides choose that. And then, depending on which which you've chosen and what your enemy has chosen, you, you uh, provide an estimate of the number of steps uh, that are attacking and they provide you an estimate of the number of defending, and then uh, there's some artillery, uh, a cavalry differential is uh, calculated, which goes into, and here's something that's unusual and uh, a little quirky, the cavalry differential, if, it, if either force has a two to one or greater uh, ratio, that is gonna adjust the die roll on the bombardment table. So you get a bombardment result, you uh, just you add up your factors and roll the dice and blow stuff up, and you'll get a DRM if you did well with the cavalry. Otherwise, you don't. Uh, then the defender, they fire their artillery and they take their step losses, and then you do odds, then you attack, you resolve the attack, and then depending on the type of attack and who won, there may be pursuit or there may not be, or you may go back into another round of combat where the uh, defender who, if they chose pitch battle, is going to have the opportunity to counterattack. And they can pick, they can only attack, uh, well, they can counterattack everybody, but they counterattack the strongest hex. And they can choose to do that or not. I think that's uh, the sequence there. And then you go through this, this could be multiple cycles in a, in a, in a combat. So then gets down into a, lo a lot more detail than that. So it gets a little fiddly uh, with the... Uh, leader initiative and cavalry differentials and terrain doesn't play that big a deal in the game, surprisingly enough. Uh, there's this uh, quirky artillery thing. Uh, you can stake the old guard's reputation, which is going to impact losses and who takes losses. Obviously, the guard will take losses if they lose. Uh, leadership bonuses, we mentioned those. Uh, there's a retreat sequencing that's pretty specific that has to happen as well. Hey guys, I see there's a couple of other people joined. Uh, what does DAC mean? Oh, well, that, you've thrown me a curveball there, brother. Hey Jordan, uh, if you're a smart guy, if you want DAC, I would grab, uh, hey Patrick and Patchwork Pictures, I don't know who you are and I've seen you here before, um, <coughs> but welcome. Uh, grab DAC 1 for 125 that's actually not a bad price and uh, you can you can adapt it to DAC 2 there's nothing not much to change buddy um, yeah it's uh, it's Das Africa core yeah I believe okay uh, anyway back to this so Uh, now, morale, so this is where morale starts to play a bigger role. If a battle is deemed to be a critical battle because of the number of losses, or if uh, certain events occur, capture of a major personality, or certain towns, that's going to impact the morale rating of the Austrians. And once it gets to negative four, the game is over. I need to move this because we're kind of uneven here. And... Uh, this desk is actually uneven because I made it. It's two huge chunks of uh, mesquite wood. And when we mounted it, it didn't uh, end up being quite, they're not quite equal when I cut it in half. This is all from the same tree trunk. You can see it's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty wide. 
and so uh, I need to remount the desk, but that was uh, 10 years ago and I've done nothing about it. It's worked just fine ever since. So there's that. There's a March attrition, as I mentioned, artillery fire tables. And then uh, in the, the scenarios, uh, the, there are battles scenarios, and then there's a campaign scenario that's 90 odd turns long. You're actually gonna have to quarter your forces for periods of time to recover army uh, cohesion and uh, capability. So that's gonna uh, play into the, uh, the story here a little bit. There's some administrative things like replacements you're gonna have to handle. So lots of stuff, right? So that's kind of the, the rules uh, in, at a very, very high level, of course. Uh, I thought you might like to have a quick look at these. And I have not worked out all of this yet. Uh, this is the leader manifest. So uh, I guess the starting locations of the different leaders for each side. And then it's recommended that when you're setting up that you put these two out, put the leaders out, put the forces out with the number of steps they have on the manifest, then put them on the board. And I got the impression that there are, that I can keep, I use this track. Maybe it's another track. Maybe there's another piece of cardboard underneath here. Yeah, it's these things here. Uh, that we use these to keep track of uh, strength of the force or whatever the case may be. And I have not rocked this yet. I probably skimmed the rules for this section, so we need to work that out. My intention was to put the leader on the map with the force underneath it uh, with the appropriate number of steps if there are indeed step counters. Uh, there are no step counters here, so I'm not sure what the, what the, what the deal is. But anyway, you've got hidden movement game, so obviously I'm not going to want to spend the entire game flipping pieces over to work out who is where. And even if I was playing opposed, I don't think I'd want to do it this way, right? Need little sleds, perhaps. So we'll be playing with strength face up, but we'll have leaders on top so that we can't see too much about what's going on beneath. So there's that. So these are, these are the counters. As you can see, if you take a quick look at these on a, uh, you know, if we were gonna count off, it looks like at a rough look, just skimming this, that the Austrians have the weight of numbers. I'm looking at artillery here as well. Leader ratings are pretty equivalent, actually. Artillery. These are vedettes. Here's artillery here. Three, 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 two, two, five. Where's the artillery over here? Uh, help me out. There we go. That's what? One. That's a march regiment. That's not even a full artillery force. That's unusual. Where am I just going blind and can't see the artillery for the French? Hmm. That's a replacement. Here's one. One there. Okay. But that's it, huh? Curious. About a decent amount of cavalry. All right. Well, so we'll look at this anyway. Okay. Uh, we'll get into this at uh, at some point. So. Uh, then you've got your scenario with the fortnights, etc. And the map is interesting. The it's called the quadrilateral because of the importance of the citadels. Oh, here's the army condition tracks as well. Replacement points, army condition track, etc. Administrative points track that you spend to. Enable armies to march, uh, kind of like a long distance strategic march. So we've got Peshira, Brescia up here. And sorry to all the Italians, I'm gonna 
butcher these words. Yeah, hidden movement is not going to work. We're going to uh, you basically what you're going to do is lift lift up the counter to see what it is, and then uh, move it. So we'll be playing face up. Um, uh, I've played these games before uh, solo. They work just fine face up. Okay, uh, so there's uh, one, two, three, four. I think these are the. Or maybe uh, Padova over here. So Padova, uh, Vicenza, Verona, Mantova. One, two, three, four. Maybe that's the four that matter. Uh, and the, these are the the cities. I think the citadels that need to be captured by the Italians. But nevertheless, we're so from a from a strategic standpoint. You can have a, a look at the road networks, the rough terrain in the northern part of the map. I'm assuming that's north. Yeah, kind of. North is uh, this, kind of this, this direction. So in fact, we're looking north, you could say. And then the western edge of the map is where uh, French forces will come in. And the Austrians are probably going to come in from this direction, I'm, I'm guessing, down this way some way or across from this direction from the eastern side. So uh, there, there's some interesting items that can uh, go down here and some interesting uh, tactics. Uh, Napoleon wrote, uh, I guess, a paper about this uh, campaign after he fought it. <laughs> Uh, after the first campaign, this campaign lasted for nearly 12 or over 12 months, I believe. Uh, let's see if I have the note here. Yeah, he said uh, the plan for Marshal uh, Wurmse was defective. His three columns were separated from each other by two rivers, the Adige and the Mincino, Mincio, by Lake Garda. So there's Lake Garda. Here's, the, uh, here's one river, I'm guessing. And here, here's the Adige River. Adige, A D I G A I D G, and this is the Mincino here, yeah. Mincio here. So he had three forces split uh, here, like this. Hey Patrick, how you doing, man? Hey Jim. And so uh, he then went on to say that uh, uh, Worms uh, could have done one or two things. First, he might have advanced with his whole force between Lake Guardia and the Adige River here and taking possession of the plateau of Rivoli, which I think would be this higher terrain here. Uh, at this point, he could have brought his artillery to bear on the river road, thus posted with his right on uh, Lake Garda. He would have had a very you know, sound position. Second, he might have uh, debouched uh, with his whole army by the Chesi near uh, on Brescia. So he's, what he's saying here is uh, they, the Austrian army could have attacked the citadel here. Uh, let's see, what else did he say? The yeah, artillery could have taken that route. In the execution of his plan, he made another mistake for which he paid dearly and was losing two days by going to Mantua. And Mantua, I saw this on the map earlier, is somewhere interestingly near a place that I can't find. Oh. You guys missed it earlier on. We talked about the rules. We kind of went over the rule book gently at a very, very high level, and stuff that I can't find. That okay? There's Rivoli. So that's uh, when we looked at that map earlier on. That's one of the battles uh, areas that where an uh, actual battle was fought. There's La Corona. It's already got a, 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 a battle cross on it. I don't know if you can see that or not. There. Wow. What's up with the focusing? There we go. Uh, so let's keep going. Let's see what else Napoleon had to say. Okay, uh, losing two days by going to some place we can't find. He could have thrown. He should have thrown two bridges over the Mincio, which is Mincio, which is this river, out of cannon range of Pashira, which is here. Where is it? I lost my place. And probably cross the river to join his right column to Lanato, 
Orsalo, Lenato Orsalo, which I guess is over here somewhere. So, uh, in any case, there's Lenato here. And there's this river that he could have thrown the bridges across out of uh, range of Peshir. Peshir. Uh, it is then a principle that, any, that an army should always have its columns so united that an enemy cannot get in between them. Uh, Yeah, and it just goes on talking about uh, where to place artillery and stuff like that. Uh, so, there you go. Now, that's uh, referring to the first campaign, keeping in mind that this runs... Uh, this runs from July 1796 through January uh, 30th, 1797. You know, historically, this ran a little longer. It started back in April and ran through to April. Uh, but this game covers just this portion of it. This was supposed to be expanded upon at some point. And I don't know that it ever was. So it seems that you know, Mr. Zucker has decided to focus on the Napoleonic Library of Battles uh, because people like tactical stuff instead of uh, operational. Which I would still call this operational. Anyway, so uh, that, I thought, was pretty interesting. And Tua should be on a river. All right, we've got a, we've got a resident expert. Let's see if we can find it. Here's Legnago. Can you see that? You probably can't. I've got the comments. When I got the comments up, I can't move the screen. Here we go. Legnago. I'm looking for Mantua over here. Don't see it. Don't see it. Trento. Yeah, I don't want to waste too much time trying to find... Uh... And here's the Po River here. Isn't it fascinating, guys? Uh, it just, just blows me away. So here we are. Here's Napoleon in Austria fighting at the Po River. Well, guess what else happened at the Po River? Exactly. How many times did the Roman armies uh, clash with the uh, Cisalpine Gauls and the Alpine Gauls or with Hannibal? And, you know, I've fought so many battles over this Po River uh, area. And then I even was reading uh, World War II accounts of actions occurring up here as well. So it's, <laughs> it's fascinating how terrain, uh, regardless of the, uh, the era or the age, really drives the uh, level of activity in a, uh, in a particular uh, part of the world. So this must be uh, kind of, you know, Switzerland would be north, I guess, up this way. I'm supposed to go up to uh, some town up in Switzerland, potentially later this year or early next year for... Uh, for work. Um, but anyway, so just fascinating stuff. So I'm looking forward to getting this set up. I'll uh, try and lay out the pieces. I've got to work out how the forces work correctly. I'm a little bemused by it all. Oh, you saw it? Manitoba, where did I? He saw it. Oh, right there. Look at that. It's a citadel. I nearly bit my head off. Okay. I thought he said it was Mantua. Yes, you are absolutely right. It looks like you're a, uh, it looks like you're a, uh, Napoleonic's buff there, patchwork pictures, whoever you are. All right. Well, guys, I appreciate you guys uh, hanging out and checking in for a little bit. This is what will be running next live once I get, uh, Objective Moscow completed. I just thought I'd, uh, do a little recon on the map, have a look at the rules. So I've read the rules, we're kind of squared away in general. I've got uh, a couple of pages of notes on the sequence of play and how things should work or how I think they work. And then I will probably play a portion of a turn before we jump into full on live play so that uh, at least some of what I do is accurate. <laughs> Uh, so well, I've got to make some copies of stuff too. I'm going to copy all of these charts and uh, kind of consolidate them so that they're 
all in one bit. This is a, a battle worksheet that you can use. Uh, I've got to make copies of that as well. I'm not sure that I will use that, but we may, we'll see. So I'm going to put all this stuff back in the case for now. I'll have to clip all these counters at some point, but we'll get to that. And I appreciate you all checking in and let's let's do this real soon. I'm going to go uh, run a turn of Objective Moscow now uh, solo and hopefully the, uh, the Soviets will continue their stalwart defense of Mother Russia, of the Rodina. All right, guys, talk to you guys soon. Thanks for checking in. All the very best.